If you're at home watching online, we want to say you are so welcome today at Evergreen. And we'd love to see you here in person because there are things that you get in person that you can't get online, like meeting each other, being encouraged, and a analog Bible. How'd you like this? This is a Bible that will never crash unless you drop it, okay? It's going to always work for you. And I, I, this is something that was kind of a, a vision of mine pre-pandemic. I was at the home of Alpha, a church in London called Holy Trinity Brompton, and they give out Bibles on Sunday. I thought, what a great idea. And then a couple of weeks ago, one of our business guys came into the church building, and somebody had paid him cash for a job. And he says, I, I don't want to you know, put this through the books or whatever. So he said, I'm just going to give it to the church. He said, would you buy Bibles? And I thought, well, that's my vision. I really want to buy Bibles. So right now we've got this book rack. I know this is real simple because we live in a high-tech world. We have a beautiful app at Evergreen. It works beautifully. And you can read the Bible. You can watch videos. And it's great. But there's something about paper. And there's something about being able to look in context and see where everything fits. So if you were able to get one of those Bibles on the way in, we're on page 935 in the Bible. Uh, if you didn't get one, put your hand up, and one of our helpers is going to come and bring that to you. And guys, if you can give me my slides, we'll start right into today's talk. Because today, I'm starting a series called Spring to Life. And our vision in this series is to get a sense of the fresh things that God wants to do in our lives, in our walk, on our journey with Jesus, but particularly out of the book of Acts. This week, I'm going to teach about what life is like without the Holy Spirit. Next week, Pastor Elijah on Father's Day, one of our newest dads here at Evergreen, is going to give the Father's Day message on what is life with the Holy Spirit. It's going to be really powerful. So we're on page 935. This is Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. Today, I want to talk about the new next thing. Are you going to be included in God's new next thing? Uh, you can't depend on yesterday. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but we have today, and God's doing something new today. If anything is clear after the last two years, the same old, same old won't work anymore. God has something new. Are you going to be in God's next new thing? As we were worshiping today, I began reflecting over my journey with Jesus. And some of you may see me up here and think this is very natural for me to be a pastor speaking at front. No, it is not. It was the very last thing on my mind. In fact, I worked overtime to make sure I would never become a pastor because I'm a sixth generation pastor. All my brothers were pastors. My father was a pastor. My grandfather was a pastor. Everybody was pastors. I was not going to be a pastor. It goes beyond that. My relatives were all leaders in the denomination I grew up in, and they all held office at the central office at the headquarters of the denomination. The last thing I would ever be would be a pastor. My commitment to God was to go out and be a successful lawyer and make a lot of money and give money to God. I remember as a kid, 10 years old, making my deal with God. I will go out and make money, and I will... I'll be super generous, and I'm going to help support the ministry, but I don't want to ever do this, what I'm doing right now. But obviously, I'm doing this. How did it happen? Well, there was a student movement that happened at our university. I got invited to a small group like Alpha. I prayed for the very first time. I had no choice because they went around the circle, and everybody had to pray, and I had to pray out loud. I read the Bible for the first time, and I fell in love with the person of Jesus, and then I knocked on a pastor's door. I went to the, the big church in the community where I lived. It was, a, it was a college church. And it was easy to sleep in late and roll in and just, you know, come to church, check in, check out. But when God began to get a hold of my heart, I thought I need to do something with my faith. And I, I'm, I'm always just doing little tests of God. And I said, okay, God, if you're really in this, uh, I'm going to knock on this pastor's door of this little church uh, on the other side of town, and I'm going to offer my help, and I'm going to see what happens. So I knocked on his door, and I said, I want to be your youth leader. They had three kids in the youth group. We grew the, kid, the youth group from three kids to ten kids and back down to three kids again. That was my first ministry. And I learned a lot. 
about people, about Jesus, about the church, <laughs> the funniest place, uh, just some quirky people in that church. But God got a hold of my heart, and here I am today. The same thing could happen to you. Well, I'm not talking about becoming a pastor, although that can happen, but being engaged in God's plan and mission in the life of the church. I had one staff member years ago, he was part of a big church, and he said, you know, God has called me to leave a place where it is happening, to go to a place where it's not happening, to see that it happens. And I think there's something really powerful in that. And right now, every single church in America and the world is being rebuilt. And this is like ground zero. Wherever you go, what you want to look for is a healthy church that's got a good vision that's based on the Scripture. We have real Bibles in this church to really make the point. We believe in the Bible. And God is building the church. Right now, scientists are finding new planets. But they're not going to find a newly created planet because all the planets were created long ago. God's not creating new planets. But what he is doing, he's building his church. The one thing he's doing on planet Earth, the only thing he's doing is, I will build my church. And you and I get to participate with him in that. So I'm, I'm inviting you into the same new thing that God has called me into because it's a fresh thing. And I think this is a kind of re-up for all of us in the body of Christ. What is God calling us to in this fresh new season? So will you be in God's next new thing? I regularly pray, based on that later chapter in Revelation, that I get to ride one of the white horses with Jesus at the end of time. I think that would be very cool. And you and I can go on an adventure with Jesus today in the process of changing lives. There is nothing more rewarding than seeing a person who's maybe lived in isolation and loneliness without a sense of purpose or destiny, to find faith in Jesus, to be with them as they pray their prayer to trust in Jesus, and then to watch the pieces of their life come together in relationship, in finance, in their perhaps marriage life or their work life. Because when people follow Jesus, it begins to come together. It is one of the most rewarding things ever. Life change becomes an addiction once you become part of what God is doing. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the, the essence of Evergreen Church. Evergreen Church is, you should be able to finish the sentence, Evergreen Church is? Jesus. That's awesome. Now we're all going to say Evergreen Church is Jesus changing lives through you. I heard a lot of power here on the front row. Let's all say it together. Evergreen Church is Jesus changing lives through you. He wants to use you and me in the power of the Holy Spirit to transform society. In the last two years, many people have been marinating in toxic thoughts behind closed doors. I mean, think about it. They're listening to perhaps newscasts that reinforce their negativity or YouTube channels with pundits that reinforce their negativity, or perhaps social media feeds that reinforce negativity. People are marinating in toxic thoughts. And what I'm seeing, and please, I don't mean this as any offense, but we're all in the same room together. The masks are off. We're all here. But there is a tension that I've not felt in society before. And it's not just in church life. I find it in public sessions and meetings even just standing in line at the store, people are a lot edgier than they used to be, aren't they? It's like we're all on the, on the edge of reacting, again, because we've been marinating on toxic thoughts. This is exactly where we find the followers of Jesus in Acts chapter 1. The last time we pick up the story, they are living in a room with the door locked for fear of the Jews. And they've been locked in this room for a long period of time. And their thoughts are negative and their thoughts are toxic. Their thoughts are about that dirty scoundrel Judas. They've been through um, the emotional roller coaster that took place in the death and resurrection of Jesus. But they still hadn't processed Judas. And there's no way they were going to move from Acts chapter 1 into Acts chapter 2 until they dealt with the issue of Judas. You know, a lot of us can encounter people in life's pathway who can cause pain. But we've got to move out of the old thing to step into the new thing. 
Acts chapter 1 is all about the old thing. Acts chapter 2 is about the new thing. If you and I are to get the new thing, we have to let the Holy Spirit flush the old thing out of our life. Acts chapter 2, about the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming in power, doesn't make sense until you fully grasp Acts chapter 1 because there's this deep pain that is in the life of the disciples, but they take time to work the pain out. So Acts chapter 1 is primarily the chapter about Judas. What do we do about Judas? The guy who betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. But then in Acts chapter 2, it's all about the Holy Spirit and about how the Holy Spirit flushes out of the heart of the disciples all of the bitterness about Judas and replaces it with power and love and joy. Now, throughout this summer, I'm going to come back to five different stories in the book of Acts. And each one of these five stories tell about how the Holy Spirit fills people. But every single one of the five stories starts with toxin. It starts with bitterness. It starts with something that has people on edge. And once they deal with what causes them to be on edge, the Holy Spirit comes in power, and then they are filled with life and vitality. I believe the greatest season of the life of the church, this church and every other church that honors Jesus and is into the scriptures and loves one another, is the best season we are ever going to see. My theology, as I understand the scripture, is as the world gets darker and darker, the church is going to get brighter and brighter. And Jesus isn't going to come back for a bride that's just kind of, you know, kind of half asleep. You know, she's spiritually dead. She, he's going to come back for a, a vibrant, passionate bride who is yearning for his return. And I'm calling us all to wake up, to step into the new thing that God has for us. And it happens when we get rid of the old and allow God's new thing by the Holy Spirit to come into us. So Acts chapter 1 asks a really basic question that I think all of us need to ask right now. What do we do with our old feelings? There was something about that homestay during COVID that locked us up with a lot of old feelings about old junk and old stuff. It could have been about relationships and people who've done you harm and done you wrong in the past. It could be irritation with their neighbors, irritation with government, irritation with uh, church, irritation with the business arena, irritation over uh, political issues, irritation over racial issues, all kinds of things that just stirred us up in so many ways. And everybody became edgy. And what are you going to do with all those feelings? The Holy Spirit works on the basis of honesty. This is the power of the kingdom. It works on the basis of confession. And the more we're honest with how we really feel in the presence of God, this is the power of confession, the more the Holy Spirit can have access to us. Because we can't receive the reality of who God is until he deals with the real you and the real me. And you and I are in a season right now where all of us, every single one of us in this room, everybody watching us online, we all have old feelings we've got to work through in the presence of God. I'm doing it. Every one of us needs to do it. On the other hand is Acts chapter 2. And we ask this wonderful question, what new thing is the Holy Spirit going to bring into my life? Because when we receive the Holy Spirit, he flushes out the old bitterness and he replaces it with new potential and new opportunity. Some of you are on the verge of your second life. Some of you are on the verge of stepping into spiritual gifting you've never used before or perhaps was dormant. Some of you are going to have greater influence in the lives of people, maybe at work or in the business arena or in the social arena or school arena, maybe athletic arena, maybe influence in your family network with your children, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews. We just go on and on. Some of you are going to step into the, one of the greatest seasons of influence you've ever known in your life because you dealt with your feelings in an honest way before God and you allowed the Holy Spirit to take over and you said, Lord, do something new in my life. Does that sound good to you? Yeah. Praise God. It's good. Hey, by the way, if you're the person who gets moved and you want to clap, clap boldly and people will follow you. It's amazing. I do this all the time. Acts chapter 1, verse 16. I'm going to use the paper Bible to inspire you all. We're on page 935. So verse 16. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, a group numbering about 120, 
and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. He goes on to say a lot more, and you feel the toxin, you feel the pain of what those early believers were going through. But I think it asks a basic question is, who is your Judas? And I know as soon as I said that, a lot of you just check out because you're thinking, well, I've never had anybody who tried to kill me in my life, nobody who tried to sell me for money. And yet we've all had somebody that's hurt us. I think the basic question with Judas is, what are the broken relationships in your life that are holding you back from where God wants you to go next? Because all of us have experienced some kind of relational breakdown. And until we process the feelings in the presence of God, we get held back by toxic thoughts. Now, I want to pay attention to their toxic thoughts so we can think about our own toxic thoughts. One of their toxic thoughts was that Judas guided the soldiers. It's interesting. Peter does not say here he sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver because the hurt was even deeper for the disciples. It was Judas himself personally who escorted the police SWAT team to come and arrest Jesus. And the memory of Judas leading the charge, Judas kissing Jesus on the cheek, was what hurt so deeply. Have you, have you been hurt deeply by people who led a posse against you? Maybe somebody who was jealous of you at work because you were going to get the promotion that they wanted to have, and so they did everything to undermine you. And, or maybe it was a, an ex, and they made that custody battle or... That, that question about the breakup of all the resources of your life together, incredibly difficult, simply out of just pure spitefulness. And we, we could go on and on. There are all sorts of ways that people can lead the posse against us, and we are deeply hurt by Judas. He was one of our number. And there's a real sense here that they're remembering the day where Jesus said to Judas, follow me. Now, we're not told in the Bible about the day that Jesus met Judas. But there would have been a day that would have been as beautiful, I'm sure, as when he met Matthew at the tax collector's booth or Peter fishing beside the Sea of Galilee. There was probably a day he met Judas and said, Judas, follow me. And Judas would have smiled and been honored. And Jesus would have been happy. And Jesus probably embraced him. They probably had a great friendship and great relationship. I know it's hard for us to imagine this, but sometimes this is what happens in relationship breakdown is we remember some of these good things that were there, but we think, how did it ever get so bad? Why did it go south? Why did it become sour? Because there were some really good moments in that marriage or in that business relationship before everybody got angry with each other. Why was it, if you've ever been through a church split, anybody here been through a church split? One of the most painful things. I heard one researcher say a church split is more painful than a divorce. I would agree. I've been through one. Incredibly painful. And so here's Judas, one of our number. There's this pain that happens in the life of the disciples. He shared our ministry. Judas would have performed miracles in the name of Jesus. G who knows? They went out two by two. And Judas would have healed the sick, maybe even raised the dead. He shared the ministry, and yet it all went south. And then they're just so delicate how they say it here. They say he fell headlong. One of the other scriptures tells us clearly that Judas committed suicide. Um, Wow, how, how do you process that? The guy that you used to travel with is now no longer here. He took his own life. He took his life because of the remorse of his regret of what he had done. There's a lot to work through. And you and I have a lot to work through. It's the simple question, who is Judas? It could be somebody you were married to. It could be somebody that you worked with. It could have been somebody you signed a contract with. It could have been somebody that you used to sing and worship with. It could have been somebody that you used to trade kids back and forth for babysitting nights, you know? Maybe you even went on vacation with them. And you, you went to some beautiful places, and you've got pictures to prove better days and better times. 
But we've all had times where relationships break down and we have Judas. And if that remains unprocessed, you've never prayed about it, it's still there. The hurt is still there. It's not always possible to restore those relationships, but it's always possible for us to restore our relationship with God (laughs) and through the power of the Holy Spirit where he can touch and heal some of the deepest pain of our life. Here's a simple principle. To overcome the past, we have to remember the past. This is what we're most fearful of doing. We want to forget the past. We want to avoid the past. We want to, you know, delete the past. Maybe you've gone through your iPhoto list and you've ripped out everybody's picture who is there. My grandmother, when she divorced my grandfather, went through all the family photos and cut them in half and got rid of my grandpa. We have all these pictures of my grandma on one side. You know, you can do all that sort of stuff, but it still hasn't changed anything. There's something deeper that has to happen. We have to remember the past in the presence of God so that there's a deep healing. The other key is it has to be in the presence of another. This is why James says, confess your sins one to the other, pray for each other so you can be healed. Church is the place where you can come and the real you is heard and seen and known. This is why you need to take time to build friendships and relationships. This is why you need to stay after church and get something from cultures. This is why you need to come to an alpha table or jump into a course we have called My Purpose to find your purpose in life and how you fit within Evergreen Church. You need to become part of one of the mowing teams or jump into serving in kids' ministry because as you begin to serve, what's going to happen is you're going to meet people and you're going to have an opportunity to talk about your real story at some point. It doesn't all happen at once. But something happens in the presence of another because where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. And you don't need to be psychologists to help one another. The Bible simply says, confess your sins one to the other. It doesn't say counsel each other. It doesn't say try to figure each other out. It simply says, and pray for each other. I have people come to me all the time with all kinds of life problems that I can't even comprehend or relate to. But what I can do is pray. And I bring them into the presence of God and he touches them and he heals them because this is the beauty of grace. It works across all kinds of situations. And when that happens, then prayer sets us free and we are delivered from the past. And this is what's happening in Acts chapter one. They are dealing with the past. They are remembering the pain of Judas. Who is the Judas in your life? I was reflecting this morning on a really difficult day in 1995. Some of you weren't born yet. (laughs) But I remember walking into the office of the guy who served with me in ministry. And there were other people sitting in the office with him with a box of Kleenex on the desk. And they were talking about me. And he looked up at me and he said, Phil, (laughs) you need to resign. He said, Phil, what you call the Holy Spirit is a load of crap. That's literally what he said. Now, there were some things that happened about five years later where he came back to me and sort of mumbled out an apology. It was really hard. I left that room and I cried like I've never cried in my entire life. (laughs) Why do I tell you that? Because I had some friends that came around and they prayed for me. And this is a whole other story, but I have the most profound spiritual experience I think I've ever had because I I saw Jesus, and I saw heaven, and the Bible talks about people who are like here, but they're there. I experienced something that is just so priceless in my journey. I think about it almost every single day, because as those believers gathered around me and prayed for me, all the pain went away, and I saw Jesus. I saw heaven. I saw things that I know are true in the Bible, but I know they're real, And he told me how to get through it. And after that, I never cried again. Uh, I was never afraid again. It got a lot more difficult. But I stood my ground. And 25 years later, the head of that denomination came to me. And she said, on behalf of the denomination worldwide, we ask your forgiveness for what happened in 1995. And then they lent us the money on this building. And the loan we're paying off right now is to that church ministry. And people, I want to get that thing paid off 100% this year. (laughs) It's my faith. This is the reason why this is kind of deep in me. 
I want to leave 1995 behind and move in to 2022 and 2023 and everything good that's beyond that. But if I hadn't remembered the past and the presence of caring people, I wouldn't be here today. I would have been crippled, just totally crippled. There were some horrible things. They put le- people in those days used to write letters and put them under your door. I'd get a pile of letters under my door, and I, I had a, a folder this thick full of mail, hate mail, poison stuff, accusing me of all kinds of dark things. And I remember one Christmas night, Leslie and I lit up the fire, and page by page, we just threw those letters into the fire, and we forgave everybody and blessed them all. And we've actually seen precious reconciliation with almost everybody who wrote every one of those letters because the Holy Spirit does amazing things. But I had to remember things in order for God to heal them in the presence of another. This is the beauty of Christian community because we come together and the real us is really known and seen. Some of you need that moment of honesty. That's why it's so important at the end of service when we call for prayer, come forward for prayer. And sometimes you can just say, you know, I have some troubling thoughts or deep, angry feelings. I just need prayer. There's a cost of having our first love for our entire life, you know. We talk about puppy love, you know, and new love. We're talking about the depth of our fresh love for Jesus. But how would you like to have your fresh love for Jesus your entire life? The price of that is repent and do the things you did at first. Consider the height from which you have fallen. You've fallen from your first love. So the price is lifelong humility. If you want to keep a first love for Jesus all of your life, keep a spirit of humility. Never become a believer who says, I've arrived I've had my fill of the Holy Spirit. I'm good. No. We're always dealing through issues of bitterness. And I think in 2022, there's a lot we need to work through from 2020 and 2021 so that we can move into 2023 and beyond into the wonderful things that God has for us. And this could be your day where you really open up your heart in ways like you never have before. So back here in verse 20. It says, Peter said to those who were gathered in the upper room, it is written in the book of Psalms. Now they're turning to their Bible and they're receiving promises from God. And they got two about Judas. May his place be deserted and let there be no one to dwell in his tent. And may another take his place of leadership. They're going to the Bible for promises and they get beautiful, precious promises And it asks the question, who's going to fill the gap of the Judases in your life, the people who caused you pain? Now, there are two scriptures that they're using here. May his place be deserted. And then the other scripture is, may another take his place. And when you reflect on those two things in scripture, these are wise words of counsel from the Holy Spirit of how to deal with the painful people in your life. You can't reconcile with everyone. And so the first verse tells us there are times that you simply have to exit a toxic relationship. You've done your best to be at peace with everyone. You can't resolve it. You can't fix it. And so you just move on. Let his place be deserted. We're not going to hang a memorial picture here to Judas and try to buff it up a little bit, make it better than what it really is. The reality is Judas is gone. And his place is now empty. But there's a second half to this, and that is, may another take his place. And here's another principle of dealing with Judases in your life. Allow healing relationships to come into your life, starting with the Holy Spirit, because he's your best friend. And then he brings others into your life who are worth having in your life. There are people who have done you harm that you need to cut off. Because you can't train them into niceness <laughs> and goodness. There's some people you need to block on your phone. Some people you need to unfriend. There's some people you need to block on social media. There's some people you need to stop trying to get them to like you. Just walk away because they're toxic. You're doing the best you can to try to reconcile. You've done the best you can to try to make amends. You're doing the best you can. You've checked all the boxes, but there comes a point where you have to step away. And then on the other hand, is don't be so hurt you never let anybody into your life again. You can go through church hurt and say, I'm not going to trust churches anymore. Don't do that, because church is where you're going to get helped and healed. You can go through 
a marriage breakup and pain, but maybe God does have a second chapter. You can have perhaps, you know, heartache in the business world, but God's got new opportunities and new things for you. Some things you got to exit and some things you got to enter. And this part here in Acts chapter 1 is so choice, but what happens after this is crazy because they think they can solve the problem of the empty chair by holding an election because everybody knows an election will solve everything. <laughs> you wouldn't have laughed like that 10 years ago. It's, it's strange to me when I read this story. There are two guys mentioned. There's one guy named Matthias and another guy named Joseph. And they are so politically astute. They make sure they have two candidates. And maybe they have posters around the upper room. Vote for Matthias. Vote for Joseph. And they're so perfectly religious. Oh, Lord, show us their hearts. But I'm, I'm a practical guy, and I read this story, and there are two things that stand out to me. First is, um, this guy Joseph loses the election. What happens? Is he something wrong with his heart? And does he get offended and say, I'm not going to go to church anymore? Because that's what happens when there's winners and losers in elections. People get offended. And then this guy Matthias, we never hear about him again. Never mentioned anywhere in the Bible. We have no idea. He disappears. Which is strange because the book of Acts is all about introducing people filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and then the amazing outcome of what takes place in their life. Lots of examples. But Matthias just disappears. And I've read this chapter for years and I've just come to the basic conclusion is that they were trying their very best to solve the problem that only God could solve. Who would sit in the chair? Yes, it's important to exit the relationships. Yes, it's important to receive new relationships in. But it's God who's got to send them in. And what's so interesting about the book of Acts is it takes nine chapters before God fills the chair. Because God's choice wasn't following Jesus yet. His name was Saul of Tarsus. He'll later, of course, become Paul. And when God calls Paul to follow him, he says, this man is my chosen instrument. In life, you can have an election or you can choose to have God make his selection. An election is when you try to make it work all by yourself. You can manipulate and connive, you know, people to be your friend or, or try to set up blind dates. I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm not saying that some of you met and fell in love as a result of blind dates. I, I got to be careful what I say here because I could offend you. But you know, we're talking about human manipulation to try to fill the chair. We're going to have an election. We're going to make a human choice to get somebody in the chair because we can't have 11. There have to be 12. Maybe God wants the chair to remain empty for a while so that he can fill it. And I think in life it's important sometimes just let the chair be empty. It's okay. Because what you're going to discover is that the Holy Spirit is your best friend. <laughs> and he is the first relationship you want to have in your life. Because when you and I leave the chair empty, God is going to fill it. I had a dear friend. He and I met about year three of his widowhood. Is that the right word for a guy? He was a widower. And he had three children, his first wife passed away from a melanoma. It was all very sudden. It was horrible, traffic, uh, tragic. He was a, a lawyer. He gave up his great practice. He worked from home so he could raise his three children. And in his grief, he told me later, he said, you know, I've only made one rash decision in my entire legal career. And he said, I regretted it. <laughs> because in his grief and his loneliness, wanting to have a mom for his kids, he went on some dates with an attractive lady. They were married, but once they got married, he discovered that she was abusive to the children, just horrifically abusive to the children. And there was no remedy except divorce. He had to save the lives of his kids. He said, I, the only rash decision I ever made. <laughs> Don't make sure you let God fill the chair. So I taught him about reading scripture. He was a 
devout believer, but the simplicity of daily reading the Word of God, applying it to life, I taught him how to do this. He literally got a chair and put it in his bedroom. And every day he would have there his Bible study books and he read scripture. One day he read one scripture that impacted him. He wrote a list, a checklist above his door of things he would do. As a result of that, he renovated his home. He got himself healthy and fit. And then, as only God would have it, uh, he met an attractive lawyer. She also had three kids. She also was a widow. They met, fell in love. They merged their legal practices. They've been married now for over 25 years and have had a very successful business life together. And now they're fully retired because God filled the chair. And when you've got an empty chair, don't be in a rush to fill it. This is why it's so important to sit alone in the chair sometimes and let the Holy Spirit be your best friend and that he leads you to fill the chair. Well, that brings us to the last part of this story. We get to flip into a little bit of chapter 2. Elijah will teach more about this next week. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't it beautiful? All of them. Not, not a, a wild contingent on the front row, but the entire church was all filled with the Holy Spirit. It could happen today. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This is the new thing God's doing today on planet Earth. It asks a basic question. Is the Holy Spirit your best friend? Because the Holy Spirit is your best friend. Jesus calls him the helper. It's almost a, a sense of a nickname, the helper. He's always helping people. He's the help or the comforter. Some of you this morning, when you got up in our January days, were buried underneath that beautiful feather, you know, comforter, and you're holding up close to yourself. Maybe you're right now watching home online underneath your coat, comforter. I don't know what you're doing. But the Holy Spirit is your comforter. He's like this warm blanket that just surrounds you. The Bible calls him the one who comes alongside. The Greek word is the paraclete. He's the one who just comes alongside. He just always wants to be there. He's your advocate. This means he speaks for you before the world. When you don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit's going to give you the words to say. It just goes on and on. The Holy Spirit is your very best friend. So when you make the Holy Spirit your very first and very best friends, he's going to displace all the toxic relationships that are in your life. All of this bitterness is in the past. This is why you don't see the name of Judas mentioned in the book of Acts from this point on. He's not a fixation. The disciples move on and they allow new relationships to enter in. The most significant, they allow the whole Gentile world to enter into their world. Their hearts are open to new things. And I think if anything's happened in the last two years, we've all become really tight and tense and we've gotten used to our doors being closed and our guard being up and it's time for us to let the Holy Spirit come in so we know who to bring in next because there are good people that God wants to bring into your life. If we start with the Holy Spirit, you're going to know who you should trust next. There are four pictures here. The Holy Spirit is called the wind. It's described here as this mighty rushing wind. And when you read Acts chapter 2, you think, well, why doesn't God do this today? Wouldn't it be so cool if we went to church and... You know, it would be so cool to Instagram that moment and put it on TikTok, you know. That would be so amazing. But yet it's happening all the time. You don't realize it. Here's why. Imagine that the whole planet Earth is a pickle jar, like the huge vlasic pickles, you know, vacuum seal. And when you open it up, it goes, you know, that, you know, and the vacuum receives the atmosphere. What's happening on the day of Pentecost is this earth, planet earth that God loves so much. The Holy Spirit has been brooding over. On the day of Pentecost, the, the lid is taken off of the planet and the Holy Spirit, he's filling the entire atmosphere so that the earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. 
So now the Holy Spirit is present wherever you want to go. You can find him in Antarctica, on Mount Everest. You can find him in Bothell. <laughs> He's absolutely everywhere. The wind is blowing everywhere. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to go to some spiritual hot spot. He's right here. All you have to do is say, Holy Spirit, come. The next picture that's given to us of the Holy Spirit is this picture of fire, and there are tongues of fire that fall on the heads of the people. Now, what's so interesting about this is that in the Old Testament, on Mount Sinai, when Moses is given the law, which the people are celebrating at the festival of Pentecost, they're remembering Moses giving the law, the rabbis said that as the fire came upon the mountain, wait for this, that tongues of fire went throughout the camp of Israel, and every Jew had a tongue of fire upon them as Moses gave the law. Now do you understand why the tongues of fire come upon the disciples in Acts chapter 2? Because what would happen under Jesus had to be greater than what happened to Moses. They were consumed with fire. And it's interesting what comes to rest, this fire, it comes to rest upon them, upon their heads. Our children last week in Sunday school made little crowns with fire on them. And I thought, how beautiful. These kids go with this picture of fire on their head. And I joked and said, oh, this is a Sunday school where our kids get their hair on fire. This is really cool. But the Holy Spirit wants to burn in your mind where all those toxic thoughts were and burn away the old and then flame it with things that are new. And then there's this other symbol that's here is this filling, the filling with the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit fills things, he also cleanses them. And all the bitterness is gone. All the hurt, all the hate. And you can be like the disciples and say, Judas is going to go to the place where he's destined to go. You just let it go. God decides what happens with Judas. And then we say, Holy Spirit, come. And the beauty with the work of a counselor, the Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit can make you better and you don't even know how you got better. Because you and I can't change how we feel. But the Holy Spirit can change how we feel from the inside out. And then the last one is the most beautiful of all, is the gift of tongues, supernatural languages. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about tongues. Well, what is this about? Is it really necessary? And that's because we're looking at it from a human point of view. Look at it from God's point of view. God has things he wants to do in your life. And he wants you to agree with him in prayer about those things. But you and I don't know what to pray about. How do we know what is God's will? Obviously, we can read the Bible. But when his spirit lives in us, God has access to pray through us. Now, get ready for this. When a person prays in the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues, the Holy Spirit is praying through them the will of God. And what happens is your mind doesn't understand. Your mind will say, that's nonsense. But your spirit's saying, this is good. God is up to something good. I had no Alpha course to teach me about the work of the Holy Spirit. I only had the Bible. I had one message from Casey Treat, who you heard last week. But I experienced what they're describing here, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I remember walking one day out in the forest and having this sense of permission, like it was okay to pray in tongues. It was like I would be able to do this if I just spoke. So it wasn't something that just zapped and happened. I was in total control. I made a decision. I'm going to experiment with this. And so I just started speaking. And what I discovered was I could easily talk in a language I wasn't taught. And as I prayed, I loved Jesus more. I wanted to read the Bible more. And so I said, okay, Lord, for the next number of weeks, I'm going to do this for 15 minutes every day and see what happens. And then remarkable doors would open up, incredible opportunities. I had a friend say to me, who came from that same network that I grew up in, he said, why is it that so many interesting things happen in your life? I said, I get up every morning, I pray in tongues for 15 minutes, and then I go out the door and see what happens next. Open the door of a coffee shop. Immediately after saying that to him, we were in the middle of Kansas, and I walked up to the barista behind the bar, started chatting, and he introduced me to the owner who was standing behind me, and she said, Pastor Phil, I'm in the middle of Kansas. 
She said, are you at the church with Christmas lights? I said, yes. I said, how do you know me? Her sister attended Evergreen Church. And my friend says, there you go, Phil. It happened again. <laughs> Wherever you go, the most interesting things happen because the Holy Spirit's got you on a journey and you just got to get into the flow. Don't worry in your mind what is happening. Instead, let the Holy Spirit take over your spirit and pray through you. Jesus said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. We human beings are really good at hurrying, aren't we? Rushing things along. Let's have an election and fix the problem. Instead, wouldn't it be good just to let the chair stay empty and say, Holy Spirit, come and you fill this. And sometimes in the moment of deepest pain and deepest grief is the time when you are most open to receive the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. So if you and I would just slow down and let God flush us out with the presence of the Holy Spirit, he's going to take you and me places that we never dreamed were ever possible. Some of you could be standing on the cusp of the greatest season of your whole life, and it all just depends on the power of the Holy Spirit to say, Holy Spirit, come.